I'm very happy to introduce this year's Overton Prize winner. The Overton Prize was established by the ISCB in memory of Chris Overton, a major contributor to the field of bioinformatics and a member of the ISCB Board of Directors who died unexpectedly in 2000. The annual prize is awarded for outstanding accomplishment to a scientist in the early to mid stage of his or her career with a guideline of up to a decade post degree, post PhD, who has already made a significant contribution to the field of computational biology, either through research, education, service, or a combination of the three. This is the 17th year that we award this prize. This year's winner is Christoph Bock from the CEMM Research Center of Molecular Medicine of the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna. I met Christoph in the spring of 2004 when he was looking for a place to do a PhD in computational biology. He had completed a master's degree in computer science and business administration at the University of Mannheim but his master's thesis had already been on a topic in computational biology in the area of protein structure prediction. Even though my lab had engaged in much protein structure prediction research, we decided at the time to enter a then only emerging new field, namely computational epigenetics. I had tried to start computational epigenetics research for two years already, since 2002, but I was unsuccessful, for one thing, because there were only few data, and more importantly, because I could not find a student who was courageous enough to engage in this blank slate. Christoph had the courage. Up to his PhD, which he received in 2008, he developed highly used software tools, such as BIQ Analyzer, for the processing and quality control of DNA methylation data, and epigraph for high-level analysis of such data. Furthermore, he used machine learning to show that DNA sequence does determine methylation level throughout much of the genome and to refine the notion of a CPG island to better reflect their regulatory role. After his graduation, Christoph moved on first to Harvard as a postdoc and then to Vienna as a principal investigator. But we continue to collaborate, and my lab still draws much inspiration from uh, Christoph's collaboration in the field of computational epigenetics. Today, Christoph's research interests comprise uncovering the functional re relevance of epigenetic signals in general, and especially in the context of cancer. Concerning the latter theme, Christoph is especially interested in bringing forward approaches to personalized therapy for this class of deadly diseases. During his stay at Harvard, he has developed methods for analyzing epigenetic stem cell data, especially a scorecard for characterization of pluripotent cell lines. This research has impacted the subsequent Blueprint Project, the large European epigenetics program of the seventh EU funding framework, which was funded by, uh, with 40 million euros. When he moved to Vienna, he included experimental work into his research. This work addresses the field of single cell analysis, which has emerged in the meantime, and has recently included CRISPR screens targeted at uncovering the role of epigenetics in cancer. I believe that we will hear on this in his talk. On the computational side, he has engaged in much methodical development resulting in a suite of about half a dozen widely used software tools for analyzing epigenetic data, which were developed partly in his lab and partly in collaboration with us. As a partner of the Blueprint Project, which uh, has finished last year, Christoph has become a major figure in that consortium regarding both computational and experimental issues. This is reflected in several high-ranking publications with Christoph as first or senior author that have come forth from this project. Christoph has received numerous awards, including 
and none the least, an ERC starting grant, the highest ranking research grant for scientists at his stage of their career, for a plan to, I quote, make and break a cancer cell by epigenetic reprogramming. Christoph has a stellar publication record with over 100 papers appearing in high-ranking journals, among them 11 first author or senior author papers in Nature and six in Cell journals. At his young age, he has already an age index of 46 Google Scholar. Christoph combines breadth and depth of expertise and vision in a particular striking fashion. He pushes boundaries both regarding experimentation and computation he is very effective in mentoring young scientists in an interdisciplinary environment. I'm certain that we will continue to see and hear much from him in the future. Christoph, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction. It uh, is a great honor to, to be here and give the Overton Prize Lecture. It's a great pleasure as well to be in Prague, uh, 10 years after my first ISMB, uh, which was in Vienna, not uh, very far from here, and which was in many ways uh, shaping my career by a lot of great impressions by feedback I received to uh, some of the work I presented there from my PhD project, and not the least because I really got excited about Vienna as a city and as a science hub. It has really developed very nicely in recent years, and uh, which certainly contributed uh, to my decision to start my lab uh, approximately five years ago in Vienna at the Center for Molecular Medicine. Um, pursuing a research agenda focused on, on personalized medicine, in particular on the role of epigenetics in personalized medicine. In my presentation, I uh, hope to convince you that personalized medicine is really perhaps the major area where bioinformatics is going to make a societal impact, and uh, then outline how uh, our research on the role of the uh, epigenome is contributing to this um, endeavor in particular in the field of cancer. So why personalized medicine? Uh, personalized medicine is really driven by the fact that many of the drugs that we're using at the moment don't really help a lot of people. And um, scientists have calculated this for the 10 most uh, kind of gross-selling uh, drugs in the US listed here. Every blue person is someone who has really helped by the drug, for example, a prevented heart attack for a cholesterol-lowering drug, whereas the red people are people who have not benefited. So, for example, for a cholesterol-lowering drug, you need to treat 20 people to prevent one additional heart attack. Um, and that's quite a large number, taking into account that many of these drugs have major side effects, and they're also quite expensive. Um, it is not surprising that so few patients really profit because each patient really comes with their own uh, molecular makeup, their own disease history, which we are not really taking into account when we prescribe, uh, um, for example, cholesterol-lowering drugs. And uh, what has changed in the last few years is that we can now really measure a lot of the uh, differences in the underlying molecular uh, makeup of the patients. And medicine, medicine is rapidly being digitalized such that more and more we can also follow the trajectories of individual patients. And this has really created kind of concrete momentum for, for personalized medicine. Uh, for example, in cancer, it is already the norm that, that hospitals match patients 
two therapies based on the genetic makeup. So example here, ovarian cancer, it is uh, common in many hospitals around the world that uh, these cancers are being sequenced if not genome, uh, genome sequencing, then at least a, a gene panel focusing on the most informative mutations. And then um, uh, medical doctors, tumor boards are deciding which patients to treat with which kind of drugs uh, based on the genetic makeup of the patient, not just the, the patient history, patient age, et cetera. And clearly this has already at this point created a lot of uh, attention for bioinformatics and bioinformatic methods are really a driver of personalized medicine. Bioinformaticians are now uh, key members of many interdisciplinary tumor boards. So they are sitting on the, bioinformaticians are sitting on the table when uh, medical doctors decide which patients to treat with which drugs. And this obviously, especially in the hospital setting, uh, where I'm also co-affiliated, has really created a lot of kind of gain in the esteem of, of bioinformatics as a profession. Also enabling a lot of our work because uh, with that gained esteem of the field, it's also much easier to get to interesting data, interesting samples, etc. And indeed, uh, I would think that uh, bioinformatics is now, has now to deliver on much of these challenges because these challenges are now real in a, in a clinical setup. We need to figure out how to integrate not just genomics data, but uh, many different layers of omics data and also uh, time series data into uh, reasonable models. We need to account for the heterogeneity that happens not only at the patient level, but with single cell technologies also on the level of uh, heterogeneity within the tissue. Um, and in particular, if we want to make medical decisions based on these models, we need to come up with very good ways to quantify and propagate prediction confidence values such that we can really be confident and tell medical doctors how confident we are in, in certain predictions. To illustrate this point, um, a project that we are currently pursuing together with the uh, um, Medical University of Vienna and the Vienna General Hospital is um, kind of an integrative analysis of brain tumor progression where we enroll uh, highly motivated patients that really want to make their, their glioblastoma uh, a case uh, a scientific study. And these uh, patients then get a very comprehensive uh, follow-up. They, they get a fitness tracker at the beginning to keep 24 hours mapping of a heart rate, a sleeping behavior, et cetera, omics profiling, single cell profiling, um, imaging, uh, digital pathology, a lot of these data coming together. And um, this is really pushing the, the, the methods at the moment to the limits. So we have all, uh, these data coming in and we, we need to figure out ourselves and as a community what to do with these data and how to interpret them in the maximum uh, uh, informative way. So we've already seen a case that I'm showing here on the bottom left uh, of a patient that was actually diagnosed with a primary embolism that could have been fatal based on the heart rate data from a fitness tracker. So that's obviously something that the, for the medical establishment is something very kind of new and unusual that, that people bring in their own data uh, with, um, that are clearly not medical grade data. And kind of putting all of this together will be a major challenge for, for the next few years that uh, we really have to address it as, as a community. So I don't have much time to go here in, in detail, but Nicolas Fraterni and Johanna Kluckhammer uh, from my lab will have talks on Tuesday morning uh, going a bit more in depth into this uh, brain tumor progression study. Um, so, on a kind of more broad political level, there's really a lot of momentum at the moment for personalized medicine. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I was at the IC Permet first meeting on kind of research, which really tries to bring together many different research communities to make personalized medicine happen in, in Europe and beyond Europe. Obviously, with genomics in England and the Precision Medicine Initiative in the US, there's a lot of uh, things going on in precision medicine, uh, trying to rethink healthcare as a data science. And I would say that the bioinformatics community really has this expertise to, and we should contribute this expertise to these major efforts um, because um, 
this gap needs to be filled, and if we don't fill it, then perhaps uh, other data sciences with less expertise about the kind of biological underpinnings of health will, will step in and contribute. And in particular, I think it's not only a service to society improving uh, the lives of, of patients, but we will also profit very much in terms of our, our basic research, because a successful clinical trial based on bioinformatic modeling would be perhaps the most uh, striking and most compelling validation of uh, that our basic research is, is really paying off. So personalized medicine is a huge field for, with a lot of topics, so I, I ha really have to focus here in order to show you some of, of our research, and I'm focusing on the role of the epigenome. Um, so if you look at cancer, uh, you see that cancer cells, every single cancer cell that has ever been looked at in, in sufficient detail has genetic alterations, has epigenetic alterations, and is also messed up in its three-dimensional structure. Um, and looking at especially the uh, difference between genetic information and epigenetic information, they, they are really different and complementary in many ways. So the, on the cancer genetic side, we see kind of accumulation of mutations and some competition of subclones. Um, but basically, uh, um, there are many uh, passenger mutations, mutations that just happen, and a relatively small number of driver mutations driving the cancer. And some cancers can uh, operate with very few, um, few such genetic mutations, uh, highlighting that there must be kind of a second layer to it, and clearly there is. There's the epigenome, which follows quite different uh, principles. So if you just know about cancer genetics and apply the same type of thinking to cancer epigenetics, you will miss much of what is really interesting because it really works in, in different ways. Uh, there's extensive epigenome programming typically early on, sometimes before uh, a tumor really develops. Um, and uh, although these epigenetic changes are inherited during uh, cancer development, they're also much more responsive to, to the cellular environment, to the microenvironment, to differentiation processes within the tumor. And uh, they are not only a genotype, they also have characteristics of a phenotype in the sense that they are being influenced by, by the underlying genetics and by, by the environment. So to really understand how this interaction might come about, um, we uh, focused on one of those cancers where there are few genetic alterations and looked at the role of, of the epigenome in, in, in this cancer. And the choice was Ewing sarcoma. Ewing sarcoma is a very aggressive uh, bone tumor in children discovered by James Ewing uh, um, if almost 100 years ago. Uh, he was one of the first celebrator do doctors in the 1930s already um, and has done much of the kind of early work uh, in kind of raising broad attention for the importance of, of cancers and pediatric cancers in, in particular. Um, this cancer um, discovered almost 100 years ago has now been uh, identified as driven by a single fusion event by our collaborator Olivier de Latre from Paris, and their uh, cancer genome sequencing studies on Ewing sarcoma have identified very few additional alterations. So um, we hypothesized that uh, the widespread clinical variability that we see for this cancer, uh, different children doing very differently in terms of survival, in terms of disease uh, course, that this might be driven in part by epigenetic alterations. So we assembled a group of scientists uh, from, from Vienna, from Paris, and from several other institutions uh, and performed a large-scale DNA methylation analysis of this rare tu tumor. We use bisophyte sequencing to study DNA methylation because it has this binary character, uh, which is very difficult to achieve with microarrays or different type of approaches, uh, where you can really distinguish the heterogeneity that is uh, present in, in tumors. And uh, with this data set, we were kind of really excited to see if we can find subgroup of cancers, a subgroup of the Ewing sarcoma that might uh, behave very differently in their clinical profiles. 
analyzing the data with relatively standard methodology was a big disappointment initially because uh, using a var variety of unsupervised methods, we really did not find any robust, any biological meaningful subgrouping of these patients. So um, if we had kind of done a purely biological or biomedical study, that would have been the end of the story. But uh, with Nathan Sheffield, we had a really talented, really ambitious bioinformatician on the project, and he dug deeper and tried to understand really, um, to working together with a biologist to figure out which kind of methodology we would need to understand what's going on in this disease. And in particular, what he did is developing a, a DNA methylation footprinting method that allowed him to infer kind of the regulatory genomics of uh, the, this disease based on kind of the depth and position of kind of dips in DNA methylation, footprints of reduced DNA methylation where transcription factors bind, um, which keeps a memory not only where transcription factors bind at this point in time, but also where they have uh, bound, uh, been binding in the past, such so that we can look back in time using computational methods into the history of this cancer. And what we saw then is that these um, tumors that we could not classify into subgroups were actually spanning a, a continuum, a spectrum of epigenetic states that were very closely related to their um, cell of origin. Um, so the model that emerged from this, this bioinformatic analysis is that an early uh, progenitor cell type differentiates and at several of these uh, stages of differentiation, the uh, initiating genetic event, the fusion protein, will come in, reprogram these cells, but the cells will retain an epigenetic memory of exactly the time point during differentiation when this happened, and this uh, appears to influence also the clinical uh, characteristics of these cancers, such that we hope that we can take this forward towards um, better stratified therapies. So this concept of um, an epigenetic memory of the cell of origin has actually been validated already clinically in a different study that we've been heavily involved in focusing on so-called cancers of unknown primary sites. So these are metastatic cancers where a patient comes into the clinic with a, a metastasis, for example, in the liver, um, but the primary tumor cannot be found. For example, because it's, it's just hidden somewhere behind a different organ uh, that you cannot even see it in a CAT scan, or uh, the immune system might have already killed the original tumor, but not the metastasis. And these metastatic tumors of unknown origin, they're really difficult to treat because you don't know where to start with your, your therapy. So all the guidelines are, clinical guidelines are based on treating breast cancer metastasis, for example, or colon cancer metastasis. Um, so together with Manuel Stella from Barcelona, we hypothesized that um, there might be kind of an epigenetic memory retained in those uh, these metastatic uh, samples. Uh, we profiled a large number of, of tumor samples and then trained um, elastic net classifiers in order to predict for every um, new tumor which uh, cell type they might be derived from. We validated this on a large number of kind of characterized tumors and then took it forward to predicting uh, these cancers of unknown primary site, which worked really well and motivated then a major effort uh, uh, co um, opted by a biotech company to run a large retrospective, uh, retrospective validation study and take this forward to uh, CE certification as a clinical biomarker. That took five years just to give you an idea that in clinical research, uh, things take time. Even if the result was already clear based on the initial study, we were very confident that it would work, but still doing it and doing it to the level that it fulfills certification requirements takes these, these additional years. But what we were very happy to see here is that there was actually clinical val uh, utility in it. Those patients that could be assigned a specific targeted therapy based on 
understanding, knowledge uh, of the cell of origin were performing better than those that could not be assigned such a therapy. This is still not a full clinical trial, which would be a, like a randomized controlled clinical trial, which would be the next step forward to really confirm and validate, but it's a very promising in our view that epigenetics can deliver um, better therapies in cancers. So to sum up this part, uh, cancers retain an epigenetic record of their developmental history, influenced both by the cell of origin and by epigenetic defects that the cells accumulate over time. This is inherited even over metastasis and uh, this can be used to make their therapeutic decisions. So if you look at this kind of very widely used, some would say overused concept of the epigenetic landscape um, with the kind of cell differentiating down kind of a, um, a valley of, um, of, of slopes, um, kind of the original model says that a cell state is kind of at a specific point in the epigenetic landscape, but really what we are seeing, it's, uh, it makes a difference how you got there. So every um, cell type or every, every, any of these cell states keeps the memory of the trajectory uh, that brought the cell here. So obviously this raises a couple of interesting bioinformatic topics and clearly this, this concept of the epigenetic landscape is one that is potentially very useful for kind of bioinformatic modeling research. It has been used in very hand wavy type of manner, um, initially uh, coming from, from a, a biologist, uh, Waddington, who proposed it uh, uh, more than 50 years ago, and um, then often used to kind of illustrate not only kind of what happens on the surface, but also that this epigenetic landscape is being held in shape by a regulatory network that is underneath it, that, um, and that in, in cancer, you really get stuck at certain steps in this process, for example, because the transcription factor or an epigenetic regulator is mutated, so one of these ropes is cut, and then there's kind of an additional hole here where you get stuck, or you kind of, um, go entirely off the plane because you overexpress uh, a critical oncogene. Um, but as I said, these uh, concepts have not been very much form formulized, uh, formalized. And uh, already you see that in the initial picture, there was not even indicated what the uh, kind of the, the z-axis actually means. Uh, some people have put potential or quasi-potential onto the z-axis to indicate that this is somehow related to physics uh, and kind of gravity landscapes. But uh, clearly, if we want to make this useful, and I think we should make this useful for uh, reasoning about consoles in a quantitative manner, we need to uh, find ways to formalize these type of approaches. Uh, some interesting work in this regard has been done by Sui Huang, who is now at the Institute of Systems Biology in Seattle, who has said, okay, what you're seeing here is essentially the uh, gene expression network state projected uh, onto kind of a 3D landscape where you would then look into kind of stability uh, attractor states, etc. So this is kind of initial steps towards quantifying this concept. I, I would still think we're not quite there yet because this concept of memory is not quite contained here unless you want to go into a really an explosion of, of states. So clearly here some good theoretical ideas will be needed to get the, the field forward. But what is a major improvement over the last few years that we have now the data that we can start trying to fit these concepts or these landscapes also empirically with much work and contribution by the International Human Epigenome Consortium with key members such as the Blueprint Project, the Robert Epigenomics and the German Epigenome Program. And uh, these are kind of have essentially succeeded in collecting a thousand reference epigenomes covering various states of the human body. A uh, major set of papers came out last year um, and kind of what's important in this context is that uh, we have now the mass of data that we can really go into modeling the epigenetic landscape uh, and 
they're building on this kind of initial success and validation that the epigenome is really interesting in the context of human biology uh, for our projects are now uh, going on that try to understand the role of human diseases from an epigenome perspective, connecting back to, to personalized medicine, what I mentioned at the beginning. So one concrete example of our contribution to this International Human Epigenome Consortium was focused on reconstructing the epigenetic landscape of the blood, really as a proof of concept study that we can, um, that this is technically feasible already on based on the data that we have. So we foc really focused it to, to get the amount of data on, on one topic that we would need it. We focused it on DNA methylation because DNA methylation has this mitotic heritability character, which is really helpful when thinking about um, uh, inheritance and epigenetic landscapes. And we focused on the human blood lineage because a lot is known about the human blood and uh, together with the Cambridge Bioresource and uh, Mattia Fontini's lab in Cambridge, we were able to sort from healthy human donors uh, a lot of the stem and progenitor cells involved in, in human blood development. We ran uh, deep isophyte sequencing using uh, a low input in single cell methods uh, um, developed in our lab and uh, based on that, we uh, bioinformatically reconstructed using machine learning methods uh, in an unbiased way, like without prior knowledge, uh, the uh, human hematopoietic lineage tree. Um, so how did this practically go? Uh, based on all the sequencing data, we trained classifiers that would predict uh, um, the different cell types uh, based on epigenome profiles. We uh, validated their performance in a cross-validation. We identified uh, where they, the classifiers are unsure, and then based on the, um, the kind of misclassifications and the mistakes that are, are being made, uh, we could actually infer um, a computational lineage tree that would uh, very closely reflect what we know uh, about the hematopoietic system. Uh, the key point here is not that we can do it for the hematopoietic system because there it has been done uh, through painstaking 20 years of fact sorting and uh, marker gene analysis, but that with single cell technology, we can now do this for pretty much any organ, any tissue that we are interested in without the kind of large manual work that has been invested into the hematopoietic system, but into very few other, other lineages. So that this really established kind of a, a, a general approach to, a pro, uh, to start characterizing these epigenetic landscapes based on empirical data. Based on this data set, obviously, we also did uh, kind of more classical analysis, trying to understand what really distinguishes key events in the hematopoietic lineage, for example, the differentiation of lymphoid versus myeloid uh, lineage, kind of adaptive versus innate um, immunity. And um, I don't really have the time to go into much detail here. I just want to highlight one aspect to it that uh, we are working a lot with is a using essentially a type of gene set enrichment analysis for genomic regions where we take differentially methylated regions or chip seek peaks or any set of uh, data that you can break down to bat files, genomic region files that contain something that you're interested in. And then we develop the Lola software tool um, to really annotate these in a, based on very large data sets that are in the public domain. Um, in much the same way as in gene ontology analysis would do, but really focusing on the regulatory regions uh, in the genome. So I'm mentioning this here just as an example for, for the significant amount of tool development that have, we've done over the years, um, always driven by the concrete biological applications. So uh, m most of the time our working is really that we go in uh, a field that we think is promising in terms of the biology, but also has the data richness that interesting bioinformatics will emerge from it. Uh, we see what works in the concrete case study, and then if something works at least two times or three times, we uh, really go forward, make it a tool, put it out to the community, and uh, kind of this way, the tools are already quite well validated when they when they are released and. Um, um, 
certainly this has worked well for us and has made uh, some of these methods quite widely available. So obviously, the, this kind of study of the hematopoietic system was based on healthy individuals. So with our interest in, in personalized medicine and the process, proximity to the clinic, we were um, eager to see if we can use similar approaches to um, dissect disease progression in, in leukemia patients. And uh, so we collected, in this case, chromatin accessibility, ataxic data for chronic uh, lymphocytic leukemia, CLL, um, which is a very chronic condition that uh, you can live with for, for many years, but where a significant people, uh, number of people also die quite rapidly. Um, and then we s uh, tried again uh, machine learning approaches in order to identify um, chromatin signatures that were associated with different disease subtypes. And in contrast to the Ewing sarcoma that I mentioned earlier, where it was really kind of not a, cut, not a categorical type of thing, uh, but kind of a quantitative spectrum. Here we saw a very clear categorical um, setup uh, based on the maturation state of the B cells that give rise to the leukemia, uh, such that based on the chromatin with essentially almost perfect accuracy, we could tell apart um, the different types of leukemia based on whether they have uh, been derived from class switched or non class switched B cells in the developmental tree. So again, here, uh, the cancer reflects in their rapid genome the cell of origin that they've been der derived from. And that's quite significant for therapy because those patients with the uh, relatively mature class switch B cells, they have much better uh, survival and need uh, much less treatment uh, than those that are from the more mature cells. So kind of taking this forward using kind of machine learning type of approaches to associate regulatory signatures or epigenetic signatures with concrete clinical data. This we can obviously run not only for the different disease subtypes, but we can run it for blood count, any type of clinical annotation. And if once we do this, we can start identifying from the epigenome data deriving uh, uh, principal components essentially um, that would um, capture much of the variability in the disease. Um, and we can place individual patients on kind of a, an epigenetic patient landscape now where we can also see them move over time. Like this was the same patient at the uh, initial uh, uh, diagnosis and this at a later point in time when treatment was uh, starting. And in particular, we can then project also, we know, uh, thanks to the close collaboration with the clinic, we know how these patients developed. We know uh, when they progressed, when they died, or when they needed treatment, etc. cetera. Um, so we can define like a hazard zone, a progression zone, where you want to uh, kind of not have your patients. And um, furthermore, for every single patient, because we have kind of a chromatin regulatory landscape underlying it, we can also give patient-specific regulatory networks that are kind of an important step for uh, kind of a biologically driven assignment of personalized therapies. So to sum up this part, um, the, I, I would argue that the data is there and the concepts are emerging and the bioinformatic tools are emerging such that we can uh, really try to take this more than 50 year old concept of the epigenetic landscape and convert it in something that, into something that is quantitative, that is testable, uh, and that, that can work also for medicine. And we can then place uh, individual patients inside this epigenetic landscape in order to improve uh, their, uh, to better select therapies for these patients. Obviously, if you look at a diagram as, uh, like this one with uh, cancer cells kind of t going off the track of the normal epigenetic landscape, you immediately wonder whether it would be possible to erase this uh, oncogenic potential, whether you could program with the right type of um, induction the cell back to a kind of a safe normal state rather than using classical chemotherapy where the goal is essentially to kill all cancer cells but not kill the patient. 
So that is uh, really the to uh, topic for, for, for the lab at the moment to see if we can put function into, into epigenetics and, and cancer biology, if we can uh, make a, a rational bioinformatic argument for which combination of drugs or which combinations of epigenetic events it would take to take a normal cell uh, into a um, uh, cancer cell back to a normal uh, cell. And one approach uh, how we are um, tackling this question is using epigenetic drug, drugs. So we need, take leukemia samples, we treat them with the number of epigenetic drugs, and we measure on kind of a transcription regulatory and chromatin landscape really how any of these uh, drugs induces changes to the epigenetic um, profile of that cell. And, um, Fortunately, this can be done in 96 volt plates and very high throughput, um, such so that this is really possible to do for thousands of conditions. And then we have a kind of this very large data set now of uh, leukemia cells treated in, uh, in th with thousands of individual drug combinations and um, time series. Um, and we can start building models uh, of drug-drug interactions. And in many cases, these are actually uh, additive, such that if you look at this, you could hope to start building kind of vector-based models where you, uh, if you have a sufficiently clear quantification of where you want to do, you, uh, you want to go, you can essentially combine a series of these vectors um, in order to push the cell into a direction where it may be less harmful. And we have developed a bioinformatic method uh, that Thomas Lenga already mentioned briefly in his introduction, uh, the scorecard, initially in the context of ESL differentiation that helps uh, making this argument, which we are now taking forward to kind of really guide uh, patient-specific reprogramming of cancer cells. Interestingly enough, you can also do it the other way around. You can take normal cells and reprogram them into a cancer cell, which is interesting because you can then have a tractable model in which you can really understand which epigenetic changes are functionally needed to, to, uh, to make a cancer. And for that, uh, we need a, a system that is much more specific and controllable because these drugs, they are very useful because you can give them to patients, but they are problematic in that they have a lot of epigenetic changes induced at the same time because they essentially inhibit the epigenetic writer proteins and thereby interfere on a genome-wide level with certain epigenetic marks. With CRISPR technology, we can do something that's kind of much more precise. We can uh, mutate the, the CRISPR um, um, Cas9 protein such that it no longer cuts the, the DNA, but uh, rather um, recruits specific epigenetic proteins to specific target sites in the genome. So this way, we can really program uh, or activate an enhancer, a specific enhancer, repress a promoter, and do this for a lot of individual positions in the genome in order to figure out what is happening on a causal level. Uh, problem here is to do this effectively, we would really, uh, because genome editing is, is relatively easy because you only have 25,000 or 23,000 genes that you're you're targeting, whereas uh, epigenome regulatory regions, it's uh, certainly in the order of a few hundred thousands. Um, so we really need, even to target just the most interesting ones, we really need a high throughput method to induce epigenetic alterations in cancer and to read out what is their effect on, on, on cell states. And here I can, so we developed a technology, CRISPR single cell sequencing, CRISPR single cell screening that does this type of purpose. And um, this was already, or a very similar concept was already in, introduced by Avi Frege on her talk two days ago, perturb seek, so I can be relatively brief here. The idea is we, um, like in a classical CRISPR screen, we take a guide RNA library that targets what we are interested in, we infect tens of thousands up to uh, hundreds of million cells in, in bulk and as, in, as a pool. And then we challenge them with whatever we are interested in. For example, have them grow in an environment that uh, mimics certain aspects of cancer. And then we perform single cell RNA-seq in such a way that we can link the individual 
expression profile of that cell to the guide RNA that was targeted, such that we have the knockout information and the induced transcriptome readout for anywhere in the order of tens of thousands of cells to hundreds of thousands of cells, which is obviously a great basis then in the computer to reconstruct whole regulatory networks. So as a proof of concept, we have taken this to T-cell receptor signaling, where we take a cell line, jerk cells, stimulate T-cell receptor signaling, and then for a lot of core key regulators of uh, T-cell receptor signaling, we actually see the response in terms of the transcriptome. And purely from this data, without any prior knowledge, uh, um, Andre Randero, who helped Paul Dettlinger on this project, uh, was able to reconstruct the epigenetic land, uh, the, the regulatory landscape or the regulatory uh, network of T-cell receptor signaling essentially from scratch. So advantage here, this is applicable to any other system, so you don't need to have any prior knowledge of the system that you are focusing on, um, and it shifts much of the biological discovery into the, uh, the, tu uh, into the comp computer because the experiment is kind of generic. It's still quite demanding, but it's generic, uh, whereas the kind of interesting um, biological discovery or discovery then that really happens during the data analysis. So in many ways on the technical side you can uh, um, it's, it's quite challenging because you normally the uh, guide RNAs in CRISPR are uh, expressed under a POL3 promoter so they don't get polyadenylated, they are not readable by uh, single cell RNA-seq methods. And how ProTerpSeq has solved this is that they have added into the vector not only the guide RNA, which continues to be under a POL3 promoter, but also kind of an expressed barcode. And then you can um, read the expressed barcode in, in the data. Um, kind of the problem with ProTerpSeq is that you essentially have two different elements here. So you need to... Uh, connect these two, and this has been kind of in the published papers really done by Sanger sequencing, which limits your ability to scale this to large numbers of cells. So you could think of, so we took, um, for, for CropSeq, our technology, we took a slightly different approach. We um, exploit the fact that when the virus integrates into the genome, it copies the element from the uh, 3 prime LTR to the 5 prime LTR. So we suddenly have two copies of the guide RNA, and then we can just delete here a stop codon and have a read through transcript, and we get uh, kind of without any need for Sanger sequencing, um, you can actually get the uh, information of which guide RNA was expressed as well as the genome editing, which really makes it possible to scale to much larger numbers. So in many ways, you can think of CropSeq as a kind of building upon and a technological improvement of, of ProTerpSeq. Um, although, practically speaking, it was developed in parallel, and the preprint we had online even before the per ProTerpSeq papers came out uh, late last year. Um, but uh, so if you want to try it out, really, uh, it depends on, on what scale you want to try it out. If you just want to have, do a handful of genes, um, you can use the ProTerpSeq, the CRISPR-Seq, which hasn't been mentioned. There's a similar technology uh, um, developed by Ido Amit uh, or our CropSeq technology. But the moment that you want to do a kind of a more than a couple of dozen or a couple of hundred um, CRISPR guide RNAs at the same time, CropSeq is really the way to go because you can work in bulk and you don't need any kind of a complicated cloning or Sanger sequencing type of approach. Um, you can combine it with pretty much any available technology, including emerging technologies that do single cell RNA seq combined with, for example, genome sequencing and DNA methylation sequencing. And what we are kind of very kind of clear about is that CropSeq is an open source protocol. We have the latest protocol online. You can get the, the plasmid and you can really start tomorrow. So especially for bioinformaticians who uh, consider doing some experiments themselves, I think this is a technology that's a very good place to start from because it is relatively generic, relatively straightforward, and it really shifts the, the challenge of biological discovery to the, 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 the computer side. So to sum up this part, uh, kind of we are 
uh, with this kind of additional ability using CRISPR and epigenetic drugs to induce changes in cell state and the very well established technologies in our lab to profile what happens to these cells, uh, we can really go full circle, uh, induce changes, see what they are doing, integrate them into predictive models and then go back. Um, and through a, uh, through a few iterations of this concept, we can quite cl quickly get at relatively, relatively high depth of understanding of new biological systems. So why do I think that epigenetic cell states are so important? Because I think they are um, a generalization of the concept of cell types as it was originally defined based on histology. Um, and because it captures uh, not only the cell's current state, like RNA-seq does, but also its developmental history, its history, and in many cases, its future potential, which is particularly important in cancer and diseases there, where you then induce changes and cells react to them in, in certain ways. And obviously, bioinformatic modeling is very important because it can provide the ultimate test of understanding and because it forces us to really go in and account for the heterogeneity and complexity that we are seeing in, in any biological system, in particular working with diseases where we can't just remove all the variability by working in the test tube or in, in low model organisms, but we really have to account for it. And that obviously is a major challenge for bioinformatics, but also what I think makes it interesting. So kind of the long-term vision, uh, so this perturbed profile predict paradigm works very well in the lab at the moment, but the long-term vision is that this can really be taken to patients. So eventually where we would like to get to is patient-specific root planning of a, on a kind of a disease landscape. And I showed you kind of one concrete disease landscape here from leuke for leukemia that we've inferred from initially 100 leukemia patients. We are currently extending this to 1,000 patient, uh, patient samples where we also have extensive trajectories over time. So we can start um, understanding really how we can keep patients out of this kind of danger zone of disease progression. And rather than trying to erase cancers completely, we can uh, seek to manipulate the evolutionary di dynamics in the fitness landscape in order to contain uh, the disease in much the same, same way as it is, has, has been successful in HIV therapy, essentially making cancer a chronic disease. So um, to sum up my talk, I uh, highlighted that uh, I, th I think as a community, we should really embrace personalized medicine. And there's a lot of demand at the moment for bioinformaticians to step in with their expertise. And we should kind of when asked or even when not asked, we should take this as an invitation and contribute to large initiatives uh, that will make personalized medicine a reality that will push forward data-driven medicine. And then on the um, second part, I hope to convince you that epigenetics has an important role to play for personalized medicine and also poses very interesting bioinformatic challenges. But there's kind of one more thing to to making personalized medicine a reality that I would really highlight, uh, like to highlight and have kind of many of you contribute. So personalized medicine is only going to work if we go out and engage the public. So uh, much of uh, this is uh, takes a whole new level of patient involvement. Uh, genomics data, now it's, it's, it's legal in Austria and I think all over Europe that you can essentially ask your healthcare provider to give you any data that you have and kind of start analyzing your own data. And for many rare disease uh, patients, we actually see this happening already. So Facebook groups named after genes that are mutated in some of these patients and patients that know as much about the disease than some of their uh, treating physicians. So in order to create this um, environment in which genetic information is really put to good use, we need to um, engage the public. Uh, we are running in Austria a major citizen science project where people can get their genome sequence and can discuss with us. We go into schools teaching genetic literacy, like much the way, same way as we've been teaching computer literacy. I think this is a very important concept for the future of uh, biosciences, biomedicine. And finally, we may quickly arrive at the, at, at the point where kind of data protection by locking away data is no longer possible because everyone of us carries a tracking device with them wherever we go. And 
collecting DNA from, from, from the room uh, would be pretty easy to reconstruct all kinds of hidden family trees from, from the audience. So really we have to find ways how to embrace uh, kind of anti-discrimination in an environment where information are more and more kind of exposed to the public. With that, I would like to conclude. Uh, much of this is a, is a major team effort, and I would very much thank uh, the team at, at the Center for Molecular Medicine and uh, the team in Saarbrücken and many, many collaborators, um, uh, the funding agencies, and also you saw that this is very much work in progress, both the, on the theoretical side, really modeling what it means uh, to be an epigenetic landscape, but then also contributing in the hospital setting to uh, concrete uh, studies. So if you're excited about this, you're considering to uh, this field for a postdoc, please talk to me after the conference or write me an email. And uh, now I would conclude by thanking again the, I, um, the society for awarding me the Overton Prize and obviously you for your attention. Thank you. So thanks a lot, Christoph, for this very inspiring talk, and I invite questions. There is one there. Hi there. I have uh, uh, some questions related to the, the druggability end of the, uh, of the epigenome, um, sort of two, two somewhat related. I was, I was interested in sort of the comparison of traditional druggability and targeting proteins where the general idea is to get the cancer cell to dead, whereas, as you're discussing, the drugability of the epigenome is to somehow get the, the cancer cell to, to repaired. Um, is that, is that a, a sort of reasonable goal on that? And I'm, I'm curious also in, in the idea of when you're talking about affecting these epigenetic factors, what is the what is the sort of degree of, of connectivity of an epigenetic factor? Is it that you have one factor that touches on multiple points in the genome and establishes this whole epigenetic profile of, of these different locations? Or do you have many epigenetic factors that each have a single point of contact? So in terms of to get a cell to a specific epigenetic state, do you have to act upon a single epigenetic, epigenetic factor that's going to set up the whole profile, or would you have to act on a whole set of epigenetic factors to, to establish one individual piece of that profile? Uh, so to answer the first part of the question, uh, perhaps the easiest is if, is if I explain in a concrete case how epigenetic drugs work. So the first approved epigenetic drug has been azacitidine, uh, which is a DNA methylation inhibitor uh, for leukemias. This essentially catches and locks and degrades the DNA methyltransferases from the cell. And uh, this drug then leads to an overall reduction in the DNA methylation across the genome, relatively evenly spread out across the genome. And this drug has been quite successful in the treatment of elderly leukemia patients that are not treatable with uh, classical cytotoxic chemotherapy, killing cells, because they are just not healthy enough. And the response dynamics have been very different than for classical chemotherapeutic drugs. So you sometimes have to treat for six months or more before you see any effect, uh, which is kind of consistent with that this is not really the killing, but it's kind of a uh, slow kind of nudging towards kind of a less problematic state. And then these patients do actually quite a bit better than those that you would treat either with classical chemotherapy or not at all. So while we have evidence that this concept is working in patients, these, uh, there's very few drugs at the moment that are in the clinic um, and much more needs to be learned to, to really see how they work. It also seems that some of these drugs may be help reactivating genes that would then make the immune system know about the cancer and help the immune system better target the cancer. So a major area of interest for the next few years will be in the integration of cancer immunotherapies with epigenetic therapies. 
To come to your second question, is it a handful of epigenetic, specific epigenetic alterations of the genome-wide pattern? We don't really know yet. So the epigenetic drugs, they really change a lot across the genome. With the CRISPR technology, we can introduce very specific changes. And kind of pursuing these two aspects in parallel at the moment will hopefully help us answer this question to what degree this is a handful of single events or kind of a more systems-wide reprogramming. I tend towards the latter, but this perhaps also because as a bioinformatician, I'm excited about kind of network dynamics much more than about kind of a single driver gene. Hello, thank you. Hello. Okay. Um, so uh, my experience in working with pathologists is that there's still a lot of resistance to this type of uh, treatments. I mean, they've, they've gotten used to breast panel um, uh, hormone screens, but when you talk to them about um, high resolution uh, sequencing, um, they'll, refer to, they'll prefer to stick with their immunohistochemistry and, and their microscopy. And part of that is because the age old adage in pathology has been tissue is the issue. It's the topology of, of the relative um, cells with, with each other that's that, that, that gives them the, more, the most information. And I was very glad to see the uh, high specificity of microscopy and immunohistochemistry on, on, on your slides too. So my, my question is, how do you bridge those two worlds in, in your work? So we have the advantage that our institute is on the campus of one of the largest hospitals in, in Europe. So we really have these people next door. And how we bridge it is by actually going there, talking to them, working together, initially uh, building trust. And now we are really like, this is why like after five years now, things are together with the pathology uh, in Vienna, now they are really moving. But it took us these years to really get to the point uh, to work together and make these things happen, to establish comprehensive panels, to take them all forward to exome sequencing, to have a clear roadmap to whole genome sequencing, and kind of to take along the pathologist, not to kind of replace the pathologist, bad idea. Uh, pathologists have absolutely critical knowledge and information that will never be replaced by uh, these high throughput sequencing technologies because they know where to cut out the tumor. So even for the sequencing, uh, if, you just, uh, if you have an expert pathologist preparing the samples for you, it's tremendously valuable as is kind of uh, the integration part when they make the diagnosis based on the combination of their microscopy data and the sequencing data that they, we help them generate. So that is a very powerful thing. The other kind of major shift, so this is kind of happening now, but what I see coming in like five years into the future is uh, technology, spatial RNA sequencing, but also spatial multiomics profiling such that uh, Kind of you take a tumor sample, ideally an FFPE sample, if not possible, a fresh frozen sample, and you essentially, layer by layer, you uh, do profiling for various aspects of the genome, epigenome, transcriptome, protein, metabolome, and then eventually you have kind of a 3D model of the, of, of the tumor, perhaps with in a virtual reality environment that you can then, then zoom in and really understand what is happening there. And uh, integrating this is, uh, in the glioblastoma project that I mentioned, integrating this with MRI imaging and this type of, uh, kind of life, life imaging of, of real people is a very powerful approach. We can use, of course, you, this you can do over and over again on the same patient, such that you can really trace how the tumor comes back after an initial successful therapy and perhaps intervene much earlier. But again, what's really critical here is to build the relationships and the contacts with clinicians that, that are treating the patients. One more question. Um, hi, it was a great talk and I was impressed by your work. I wanted to ask as a follow-up to your work on the immune uh, lineage, whether you have looked at the immune infiltrate uh, in tumors and whether there are cells there that are modified by the presence of the tumor. Yes, uh, so um, 
tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocytes is obviously a, a huge topic and very interesting. Uh, and people have successfully used gene expression data to quantify the level of um, tumor inf infiltrating lymphocytes. DNA methylation has not yet been extensively used, but in my view is tremendously powerful for two reasons. Firstly, DNA methylation is a binary mark, not, uh, whereas gene expression is a quantitative trait. Um, and binary mark means it's very easy to quantify. So if you have 10% of your cells have a certain methylation profile, then you know that they come from 10% of the, uh, or 10% of your reads have a certain methylation profile, then you know that they come from 10% of the cells. Whereas if you have gene expression profile, you can never really go back from the information of the expression levels to the percentage in the, in the tumor. The second aspect is, uh, this is kind of, again, ref, uh, mentioned, like if you want to discuss this in more detail, uh, I can recommend Johanna Klukamer's talk on, on Tuesday. We have uh, established methods to do very high quality or reasonably high quality profiling of DNA methylation from FFPE tissue, so from routine uh, fixed material in the clinic, which is much easier than working with fresh frozen tumors for, for patients, for, for, for clinicians, and you can go back to very large cohorts. And Johanna could show that she can predict gene expression signatures of tumors from the methylation data. So in, in the question that you are asking, uh, it, is, it, is, it will be possible with a good data, uh, with a good set of tumors and uh, suitable DNA methylation technology to get very precise uh, predictions of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but it hasn't been done yet. Thank you. All right, thanks for the question, and we'll now finish by presenting the award. So there are three items, a document, a, what do you call that? Structure and a bag. Christoph, my pleasure. So thanks a lot. We'll have coffee now, I think. <laughs>